Luke chapter 8, very familiar passage of scripture, verse number 43. And a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And all denied. Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I'll take my simple title from verse number 46 tonight, today. And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me. And I'll preach for the next few moments on the subject simply a revival for somebody. Amen. Will you lift your hands all over the house again? And let's ask the Lord to speak to us today. Jesus, we love you. Let your word do what your word does today. We are nothing without you, Lord. and We need your help today. We need you in every aspect of our lives. And we give you all the praise and glory. Let us be transformed by the power of your word today. Let our minds be renewed today by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I hope that by the time this message is over, you'll not look at this passage the same way. If you've ever been in a Pentecostal church, you know that it can be an interesting experience. So interesting, in fact, we've been called everything in the book by the secular Christian world, and even though... Pentecostalism is thriving right now. We've been called a cult. We've been called rioters, demonstrative, crazy, possessed, different, and the list goes on and on. And I make no apologies about it. Our preaching is different. Our music is different. Our worship is different. We're just built different. And I say, why not? The Bible says we're peculiar. The Bible says we're set apart. The Bible says we're chosen. The Bible says we're different. So let's be different. Let's stop trying to have everything that everybody else has. Let's be different. Let's stop trying to model our services after denominations that are dying. Let's be different. Let's stop trying to remake our mold to mirror services where there is no power. Let's be different. We are different. More than likely in our services, you're going to, hit, you're going to have one person in one ear saying, hold on, and the other person in another ear saying, let it go. More than likely in our services, you're going to see people rolling on the floor. More than likely in our services, you're going to hear people hooping and hollering. More than likely in our services, you're going to hear somebody speak in tongues and somebody give an interpretation of that tongue. More than likely in our services, you're going to hear prophecy come forth. And if you're not, I question what kind of a church you're going to. I love being a part of the apostolic church. I love the experience of Pentecost. It's biblical. It's right. It's in order. It's what our world needs. And I can positively say that one thing that separates us from other denominations is our preaching. There is something about a preacher who has the revelation of the mighty God in Christ and under the unction of the Holy Ghost can Stand up and declare, thus saith the Lord. Not everybody you hear in our churches may be able to 
stand up and give a master class on homiletics or persuade you that they are a silver-tongued orator. But when the anointing hits... And when the oil starts to flow, things begin to happen in the atmosphere. And faith is born. And somebody receives hope. And somebody receives their miracle. And somebody gets a breakthrough. Because the reality is that faith begins to cultivate when somebody begins to listen and hear what the Word of God is saying. And when the word comes forth, it doesn't matter how boring it is, how dry it is, how unimpressive it is, or who is preaching, or how old they are, how experienced they are, whether or not they got a college degree. The word by itself can make a believer out of the cynic. The word can bring peace to a troubled mind. The word can change a heart of stone into a fountain of forgiveness. The word can transform the impossible to possible. I love it when the word is served on a silver platter. But the reality is the word is so powerful that anybody who can hear what is being preached, no matter how profound or simplistic, can reach into a dimension of faith that is birthed in the atmosphere. And when preachers begin to preach, what we're preaching is not to impress anybody. Most of what we preach can't even be explained in its attempt to reach that audience because we are attempting or should be attempting to be led by the Spirit. And when we're led by the Spirit of God, there are some times we can't pinpoint who we're preaching to. All we can attempt to portray to you is what we're feeling in the Holy Ghost. And if you've ever preached, you can testify to this. There are times in the middle of a sermon that God will tell you to take a 90 degree turn right there and the Holy Ghost will say something or direct your attention to something that has absolutely nothing to do with your notes because somebody needs to hear it. Pentecost is the only religion where the preacher can get up in the pulpit and be so vague and yet so direct at the same time because a preacher can go into a prayer room for two hours and then come out and not know who he's preaching to but know what he needs to preach about. And he feels a burden for souls in that service. And he feels a need for repentance in that service. And they feel a walk towards victory in that service. And they feel a prophetic word in that service. And they feel breakthrough in that service. And so, to the best of their ability, they try and convey to the congregation what the Lord has put in their spirit in hopes that somebody will be be able to reach out and grab a hold of what the Lord is trying to say and in turn the Lord will reach out and grab somebody and get their attention and even the Bible says that while the word of ground the word of God will fall on both good ground and bad ground it also says that it will never return void and will accomplish what God intended to accomplish in somebody's life in that service and if you've ever been around Pentecost you know what I'm talking about I've been in so many services where the preacher will get up and boldly proclaim somebody can get their miracle today. Somebody needs to hear me right now. Oh, I wish somebody would preach with me. Somebody shout right now. Somebody needs to run. Somebody needs to dance. And you're like, who is he talking to? Is there somebody here named somebody? Who is somebody? And to some degree, to some it may sound cliche, but not when you have an understanding that the word will never return void. Because the word is always reaching for somebody. And the word always has something for somebody. And the word will always make room for somebody. Somebody. 
That word somebody always creates an element of faith because if you wake up to what the word is saying, you are able to realize on any service, no matter how dry, how boring, how absent it may feel, you realize somebody could be me. And when I look through the portals of time, I observe there are a lot of somebodies in history that changed the world and yet we'll never know who they are. It was in 1909 that magazine publisher Bill Boyce went to London to make the purchases for a photography safari that he and his team would be taking to East Africa. As he was preparing for his journey, one day he became lost in a thick fog as he began calling out for help from somebody. He began to see a light making its way toward him. As it got closer he began to distinguish it was a lantern. And holding the young lantern was a short 12 year old boy. He quickly guided Bill through the fog back to his place of residence. When Bill tried to give the young boy a tip the young boy replied, no sir I am a scout and do not accept tips for courtesies or good turns. And the young boy walked away. Bill never caught his name but that one act by somebody was a gift of unmeasurable value to a nation the boy would never know. He's revered to this day as the unknown scout and Bill was so inspired by the acts of somebody that he came back to the United States and started an organization called the Boy Scouts of America. It was on Sunday January 6th, 1850 a snowstorm descended on the small town of Colchester, England England. Caught in the storm, 15-year-old Charles Spurgeon decided to take shelter in a tiny primitive chapel. There were about a dozen people in the chapel that day, and as he sat there, he found out the minister had been snowed in. There was an unknown, uneducated, and unnamed somebody who was a shoemaker that just happened to bring his Bible with him that day to church to hear the Word of God preached. And when the minister didn't show up, this somebody climbed up to the pulpit, opened his Bible and began fumbling over the words in Isaiah 45 and 22 where it says, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And as he finished his makeshift sermon, he looked at Charles Spurgeon who's now known as the Prince of Preachers and told him, Look to Christ. You have nothing to do but look and live. And that was the day that somebody helped put a burden into the life of somebody else who would later preach and change the world. The stories are endless. The famous Apollo 13 mission failed on April 13th in 1970 because the number two oxygen tank on board had been accidentally dropped during maintenance by somebody causing slight internal damage that caused it to later explode. We don't know who they are. History just remembers them as somebody. In the 1980s at a missile watch location in Montana, there was an un named employee who saw the lights come on that indicated Russia had set off nuclear bombs. He sent word to his superiors that he would not fire in retaliation until he had a confirmation. This man's name was never known to the public, but they later found out that the indicators had been a false alarm. Because of this, someone named somebody single-handedly saved the world. In Virginia at Arlington National cemetery. There walks a soldier both day and night in front of the tomb of the unknown soldier guarding memories and remains of unnamed men who gave their lives over the course of history to protect. He doesn't know who he's guarding for there are too many names that were lost in the course of history. All he knows is he is guarding somebody who decided they were going to give everything for the cause of freedom. And we even say phrases like somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got an attitude. Somebody's grumpy. Somebody's got to take the heat for it. Somebody's got to make it happen. Somebody said. Somebody heard. Somebody went and we even come into church saying things like come on somebody and somebody can be healed right now and somebody can get their breakthrough right now. Somebody do something and I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire and in the middle of the 
man of God saying all of this, your faith begins to twinge a little bit. And hope breaks forth in your spirit just a bit because maybe, just maybe, you think he could be talking to you. And hear me when I say today, God never intends for a service to go by where nothing happens, but faith operates on the edge of the unexplainable. And we must realize that every time we come into his presence, he's looking for somebody that wants to partner with him in that service. He's looking for somebody to extend their faith in that moment. He's looking for somebody to believe for that impossible opportunity. And that's the beautiful thing about coming to church is you never know what is going to happen or who it's going to happen to. It could be anybody. It could be the person that's had enough. It could be the one that's blessed. It could be the one that has faith. It could be the one who has no faith. All we know is God is looking for somebody. Come on, in the application process to get involved in the kingdom of God, you are able to see the description of who God is looking for. He's looking for somebody who's hungry. He's looking for somebody who's desperate. He's looking for somebody with nothing left to lose. He's looking for somebody who's serious. He's looking for somebody that wants to be healed. He's looking for somebody that wants to be delivered. All backgrounds may apply all races may apply all tribes may apply all generations may apply all sinners may apply all saints may apply because the word is looking for somebody that just wants to be used of God Amen. And we come to the familiar story about somebody in Luke chapter number 8. The living word, the king of kings, the lamb for sinners slain, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the one who wears the key on his shoulder. Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. And as he's on his way to give revival to a little girl, Luke begins to tell us a story about somebody. And so many prolific preachers have preached incredible sermons about this unnamed woman. And with the word somebody only being mentioned twice in the entire Bible, with as much as everybody has preached about her, we really can't tell you much about her. Except Matthew tells us she's been diseased with an issue of blood for 12 years. Luke tells us she has money issues because she spent all of her living on doctors. Mark tells us she's got trust issues because every time she's put her trust in doctors, they have tried every form of drastic treatment and left her worse off than she was before. None of them could heal her. None of them could deliver her. She's got a lot of issues. She's got a lot of problems. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you got issues. But, but that day, according to Mark 5.27, somebody with a lot of issues heard that the word was coming by. Here comes the word. Here comes the lion. Here comes the lamb. Here comes faith itself. And she heard that he was coming. And she's out of hope. She's tried everything. And she needs some faith. And how does faith come? By hearing. And there may have been a lot of things wrong with her that day. But that day nothing was wrong with her hearing. She heard Jesus was passing by. She heard the word would be nearby. She heard Jesus was a healer. She heard Jesus could do what others couldn't. She heard the reports about this man and when she heard of Jesus a little bit of faith started to rise up in her again and she said maybe just maybe today can be a different day for somebody like 
me. Faith that day came by a little bit of hearing. And that's the power of the word. You can even hear about the word. And it can start to create faith where there was no faith. Perhaps that's the reason why some never receive their miracle. Because their ears aren't tuned to what the spirit is saying to the church. And they don't want to hear what the word has to say. But he that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. And all she knows is that for 12 years, for 144 months, for 4,380 days, for 105,120 hours, for 6,307,000 minutes, for 378,432,000 seconds, she has dealt with an issue of blood. And the crowd is thronging Jesus and everybody's pushing him and everybody's touching him and everybody's screaming and everybody's shouting and everybody's trying to get a blessing and she decides that she's going to press through everybody and touch the hem of his garment that day. And if she can do that, she believes she will be made well. in the middle of everybody trying to get something from God somebody reaches out and says this is my day and she touches his garment and when she does immediately the issue of blood stopped and when it stopped Jesus stopped and he turned and asked who touched me and everybody denied it. Peter denied. Peter always seems to be around when people are denying things. And Peter tells him, oh, Jesus, you're in the middle of the crowd. You're in the middle of the press and you're asking, who touched you? What are you talking about, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. Everybody's pressing on you. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, 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 no. Today is a different day. Today's not about everybody. Today is about somebody. Because Jesus says in Luke chapter 8 and verse 46, hey, 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 today somebody touched me. And for the first time in the Bible, we're introduced to the lady whose name is somebody. And we preach and we don't know who she is. We don't know her. Oh, let me tell you, she had a name. Jesus looks around at everybody who is thronging him and pushing him and says, hey, somebody touched me. Where is somebody? And the lady who touched him had already started to walk away. And when she saw that she wasn't hid anymore and everybody could see her and all eyes were on her, she begins to tremble and sheepishly raises her hand and said, I, I, I'm somebody. And he looks at her and tells her the same thing he told the leper. Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And I think that day Jesus tries to get everybody attention by reminding them the crowd doesn't have to know who you are you don't have to be perfect you don't have to have, have the right last name you don't even have to have it all together somebody can be anybody that wants to touch Jesus come on somebody can anybody that wants to get closer to Jesus somebody can be anybody that wants to get near Jesus somebody can be anybody that has a desire to reach Jesus so I ask it today is there somebody in the house that has enough boldness and audacity in your spirit to humble yourself and say I'm somebody with a need I'm somebody with a past. I'm somebody with some issues. I'm somebody who needs a touch. I'm somebody who needs a healing. I'm, that's me. You're preaching to me. You're talking to me. And 
and I know if I can reach Jesus, everything will be. Hey, this isn't just for the Jew or the Gentile, the rich, the poor. This is for whosoever will. This is a revival for somebody. I'm bold enough to believe that somebody can be healed this morning. I'm bold enough to believe in my spirit somebody can be delivered this morning. Pastor, I, I remember walking into a service one day at one of the lowest points of my life. And I've grown up in this. I, I have been blessed to be exposed to the supernatural elements of Pentecost for as long as I can remember. And I love those services where the spirit is just unpredictable. And miracles break out and wonders break out. And my nature is to usually stay towards the shadows and watch others be blessed because I'm usually praying with them or for them. But on this day, I, I walked into this service broken. There were thousands of people there. I, I just wanted to sit. I wanted to absorb. And the preacher, who if I mention his name, you know who he is, he got up and began to preach that night. And he got up in the middle of his message and he began to get in the spirit. And they begin to say, God wants to heal somebody's heart today. He said, God wants to heal somebody's emotions today. And I thought in my mind, God, I want it so bad. I want healing so bad. But with all of these other people here, sure. He's talking to somebody else. Surely he's preaching to somebody else. I mean, surely there's somebody else here who needs it more than I do. They have so many more needs than I do. But, but I said, maybe, just maybe, God is in this place for me today. Oh. And I went up to the altar on that side, out of the view of everybody else, just not in front, but really as far as you could get to the one side. And I just lifted my hands and I began to pray. And I just began to talk to God and say, God, I need your help. And as I lifted my hands and began to pray, God, I need you. God, I need you to come through. I need you to help me through this trial. I need you to help me and strengthen me. My eyes opened briefly. And I saw the speaker set down the and he started to make his way to my side of the platform where I was standing. And I thought, surely he's not coming over here. He's not going to come all the way to where I am. He's not going to come when everybody else has. So, but as I was praying, he kept making a beeline for me. And he came over to me and laid his hands on my head and began to pray over everything that I was going through in that moment. He started naming specific things. He started talking exactly what I had been talking to God about about moments before and I begin to feel the love of God come over my mind and I begin to weep and God begin the healing process in my life that day because in the middle of thousands of people that day I was the somebody who God had decide, decided to have pity on that day I drained a little bit of virtue out of God that day I got the healing God was giving out. Oh, I've watched so many things happen in this in this Pentecostal experience. I, I've watched where God would begin to move on a preacher. I watched one lady who at the end of service, I, I, I was there. She could not walk. I, I had grown up around her. She could not walk. I remember the spirit hitting this man and this, this person who had just spoken the word of faith and he walked to where she was and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And this lady who was not able to walk, I remember, she stood to her feet and she started running around the church because that day it was, it was her God decided, I'm, I'm going to come for you today. I'm going to deal with somebody today. So now, let me preach it like a preacher who has been praying and focusing on this service yesterday and today. Here's my altar call as you stand to your feet all over the house. This is my altar call today. Somebody can be healed right now. Somebody can get their breakthrough right now. Come on, somebody. We're cheering you on. Somebody can.
can get their miracle right now. Somebody needs to hear me right now. Come on, I wish somebody would get with, this is the altar call right now. Somebody needs to shout it out right now. Somebody needs to run right now. Somebody needs deliverance right now. Somebody can receive the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody can be delivered right now. Somebody can be baptized today. I need somebody with enough faith to reach out right now and say, I don't know what anybody else is doing, but today on this December Sunday, I'm crazy enough to believe that somebody can be me and I can receive what I need. Come on, I don't want you just to come and stand. I want you to come with your hands raised, believing that God sees your need and God hears your cry. And just enough faith can be birthed in your spirit to say, yes, somebody can be me today. Come on, I'm believing for a miracle. I've got enough faith left in me right now to believe that somebody can be me I'm not just preaching to everybody I'm preaching to somebody who's hungry I'm preaching to somebody who needs a little bit of a helping hand I'm preaching to somebody who's sick and tired of dealing with that lifestyle who's sick and tired of dealing with the addiction who's sick and tired of dealing with the issues and you can reach out today and touch him come on he's walking through the auditorium right now if you need a miracle I dare you to throw your hands towards heaven right now. Come on, throw your hands up right now on this Sunday morning and believe God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Come on, you can be healed of cancer today. You can be healed of sickness today. You can be healed in your emotions today. You can be healed. You can be touched. You can be delivered. Come on, she didn't care who was around her. She didn't care what people thought about her. She just said today, watch this, I'm going to be somebody. Come on, today is a revival for somebody. Today is a revival for somebody. Come on, is there a somebody in the house that can pray and shake heaven right now? Is there a somebody in the house that can touch the Lord so intently that virtue is drawn out? of? Come on, he's got enough virtue for you today. Come on, is there somebody in the house that's brave enough to believe you can make it? Come on, I know it's Christmas time and we get caught up in the lethargic 
the day-to-day motions during this season. But if there's anybody in this place today that needs a miracle, you need a miracle from the Lord. I'm not going to just preach this and not practice it. But if you need a if you need a miracle from the Lord today, I want you to come stand along the front. Because today is the day that somebody gets their miracle. If you need a if I don't know what it is, mental, emotional, physical, whatever it is, if you need a miracle from the Lord, I'm I'm, I'm not gonna call again. I just want you to come stand along the front. Thank you for coming. Thank you for responding. Thank you. Thank you. God does miracles because God likes doing miracles. God does miracles because he loves his people. And he said, it's who I am. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith in just a moment. And I believe and I know that God's going to come into the needs and situations and circumstances of people and somebody's in this building today. And you're going to leave here changed. You're going to leave here changed in your mind and your thinking and your heart and your emotion. You're going to leave here changed today. And you're going to be healed today because that's what our God does. Yeah, He does it during Christmas time. He does it all throughout the year. It's just who God is. I'm I'm, I'm going to pray this prayer today and God's going to do it. It's not going to be complicated. He's just going to do it. I want you to lift your hands if you walk to the front. And you need something from the Lord, I want you to lift your hands. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. And when I say in Jesus' name, I want you to begin to call out to God and say, God, I receive it today. I receive that miracle in my body. I receive that miracle in my mind. In my finances, whatever the miracle you need is, I want you to begin to say, God, I receive it. And God, I rejoice in it. And it's happening already. I want you to lift your hands all across the front right now. I want everybody else to join. And if you're not up at the front, stretch your hands towards everybody in the front right now. And we're going to believe as a united body that God is changing and transforming and doing a miraculous work right now. Come on, stretch your hands forth right now. This is Pentecost. Come on, this is what we do. This is what we believe. This is it happening right now. Come on, stretch your hands towards heaven right now by the authority of the Word of God and the power that is in the name of Jesus. Right now, let your healings be loosed in this house. Right now, let deliverance be loosed in this house. Right now, let the miraculous fall in this house. Let them be healed from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. Let them be healed right now in their minds, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, whatever it is right now. We believe, and we believe, and we believe, and we believe that God is healing. We believe that God is doing it right now. And we call it done in the name above every name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Lift your hands. Begin to say, I receive it, Lord. I receive your healing. Come on. There's power in the name. Come on. It's happening right now. You can receive the Holy Ghost today. You can be delivered today. I receive it, Lord. Come on. That's it. The Holy Ghost is moving all across this building, front to back, side to side. This is a revival. 